Welcome back, players. I'm Jack with 36 Cancel, and this is Coco the Wise Cat. So, Heaven's Feel Volume 2 has just come out, and there's a bit to unpack about it. And the best way to lead off that discussion is that this is actually the first Fate set to come out while I've been playing Weiss that I haven't bought any boxes of, and it was like that for a lot of other collectors and players, and for good reason. The set, all things considered, is very hit or miss, and the misses are super hard and the hits are super strong. Many of the new combos, new stylized in flavor packages, and a lot of the new stuff that's more centric to the set's own mechanics aren't amazing. However, there are extremely strong options hidden among some of the bulk. The bulk of it though, not great. And it's important to contextualize this in the light of other Fate sets, especially Heaven's Feel Volume 1, which was practically bursting at the seams with amazing cards. But before we talk about the diamonds hidden in the Menor Heap, I do want to say one thing. Something Heaven's Feel Volume 2 has against it, of course, is the choice to use hot stamps with logos and printed words rather than actual VA signatures. I've talked about this in the past, and I can see some good points as to why Bushiroad has to do this with some sets to make them viable to release in English without paying an extreme amount of licensing fees. Of course, it's not as if anyone outside of Bushiroad can examine its cost versus its revenue benefit, so we'll never have a concrete answer on whether or not this is good practice from a business standpoint. But what we do know is that the stamped cards are in no way more popular than signed cards, and Fate, being what it is, is one of the worst sets you could take signatures away from. This is in no small part to the fact that the entire Fate franchise is basically one of the largest levies of waifu tax and fountains of character love in existence. I'll say this much, people are not pouring millions of dollars a year into Fate's mobile game for its amazing gameplay or riveting story. But enough about that. Now I was going to bash the set a little here for not really living up to its predecessors, but then I realized something. The strong staples that come out of this new set are almost so strong that it doesn't matter. But before we highlight these, let's talk about the set as a whole. This set is very much inwardly focused, and many of the zeros, threes, and even level 1 combos work with packages of events and pairings that you don't have in the other Fate sets. This is very reminiscent of the Konosuba movie sets and other movie sets, where the tools are very much designed to work independently of the other expansions within the title, and this design choice sometimes makes it tough to fit existing good toolkits into a hybrid deck of new and old. However, if you can strike the right balance, it makes for a powerful new deck style supported by a rock-solid foundation. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Shadow deck you can make with the new Corrupted Sakura stuff at 1 and 2, and the Red Servants, nor will I visit on the Kodamine suite. It just sucks. This would be the miss part of the set. They also did Shiro pretty dirty considering how much of a fucking boss he was in Heaven's Feel, giving him a bunch of useless zeros, sans one green with Rider that can be used pretty well with the old Sakura combo, a terrible level 1 combo that does not live up to that inherited arm at all, and a mediocre level 3 that can be used as a tech option, but isn't too amazing. Which, by the way, makes me very angry that this is what Bushiro chose to print to encapsulate one of the most amazing moments of the Fate VN, Nine Lies Blade Works, or Nine Bullet Revolver, depending on your translation. So all that said, like we usually do, let's start at the bottom at zero and work our way up the levels, talking about what this set brings to the already overflowing table of fate. Now, like most of the set, much of the zero is inwardly focused and the techie stuff centers around the set's own packages, and being that only a select few of these packages are decent, it disqualifies many from being viable. But that said, there are some very strong new tools. This new Rider Ricky is actually damn good. On play, you can pay one and clock yourself and salvage a level one or lower character, and when her damage is cancelled, you can put her into your stock. You're going to be hard pressed to find a Ricky with an effect that generates advantage after you Ricky. This is really good, and I imagine you'll see it in many Fate decks in the coming months. Also at zero, we have a new clock bombing Sakura. Besides being a level zero clock bomb, she has another ability that if she gets reversed on your opponent's turn, you can pay one and keep her around until your next encore phase, basically letting you pay an extra stock for a slam dunk attacker and a level zero bomb across turns. Is it great? Maybe not amazingly busted, but the advantage is still pretty good, and I imagine it will see some play. Also at zero, we had this new Saber Brainstormer. She's a tap self-searching Brainstormer for Masters and Servants, and when you play a Climax, she gives two of your characters plus 500 power. She's universal for any Fate deck, finally offering a good and inexpensive Brainstormer for that role, and she hard replaces the old Trace on Shiro Brainstormer in any yellow Fate deck. There's also two new alternative back row options with Rin and Shiro. This Rin lets you pay one and rest two characters to top check four for a level one or higher card, which is kind of like an almost guaranteed Brainstorm that can also hit events. Which of course has some synergy with the new events in the set, and her other ability that you can pay one, pitch an event, and salvage a character. There's also this Shiro and Rider in green, which lets you give something 1k when you play a Climax, and also rest itself to give one of your opponent's characters in the center stage minus 1k. This isn't terribly amazing, but it lets you win some very good trades on board, and it also turns on your Sakura level 1 combo from Heaven's Feel Volume 1, and helps her get those reverses. 
And finally, an expensive staple, Silver Thread Alchemy Ilya, was reprinted, making her far more accessible to new players, which is great. So while there are plenty of misses at zero, there are also some pretty good hits. But moving right along, level 1 has a lot of new stuff for us. In fact, it introduces a whopping 5 new level 1 combos. For the sake of my sanity, we'll be skipping over the Sakura Shadow stuff. Instead, let's move to the two new combos in red and blue. You've got a new Rin combo and a new Ilya combo, both on 1k1s, 1 a gate, 1 a pants, the Rin with the cigarettes combo to mill 2 and salvage an X or lower character where X is combined levels of those milled cards, and the Ilya top checking 4 if you have 5 or less stock on attack, but they both sit around 5k and don't do much else. They are on attack advantage, making them strictly better than some of the previous options, but Fate has never been famous for its disgustingly broken level 1 combos, and these take those options from slightly subpar in red and blue to playable but not amazing. The new Shiro combo, which on reverse gives itself the ability that when it's front attacked, allows you to bounce it along with another character to your hand, sits at 2500 power, and offers nothing else except a power boost for itself or someone else when it attacks. It's just bad. The Rider combo, put a character in your waiting room into your stock and top check for a character when your opponent levels up. I mean, you have to do this all at once, so yes, if your opponent levels up when you're attacking, you do get the 3 stock, but all 3 of those top checks can miss. She's also not a master, which really hampers her synergy with some of the more established and powerful fate stables, like Resolution to Fight Shiro or Silver Thread Ilya. Now again, while I think the red and blue level 1 combos are just okay, I also think they hard replace the old ones in their respective decks. In the updated deck lists I'm including in the description, I do have them in place of the old stuff. As for the rest of level 1, I don't know why Bushiroad decided to print two new level 1 brainstormers, especially ones this bad, and the deep hatred they have for level 1 Akatsuki's is very plain to see with how hard they nerfed some of these new card effects. So the rest is very much nothing to write home about, and it falls quite hard into the miss category. But it's time to move up the chain, because there's something pretty interesting at level 2. Battle with Mage's Saber is a 2-1 global plus 1k assist that has a second ability. If she's standing in your backstage, you can pay 2 and pitch 4 master or servant characters. If you do, you can choose her as the attacker, making a direct attack. Now this is incredibly expensive to pull off, but she's in a sister that gives you an extra attack from your back row without a climax combo that cannot be backed up against. I'm pretty sure we've never seen anything quite like this before, and while I'm sure it's not going to be activated every game, I can definitely see this card winning you games you had no business winning. Finally, moving up to the level 3, we have some very strong options. Starting off, I want to talk about this Sakura. Makari's Grail Sakura is a draw 2, pitch 1 on play, and she has 2 on attack abilities. First, if you have her Climax combo, which is a gate in your Climax zone, you can put the top 3 cards of your deck into your stock. And second, independent of the combo, on attack, you can pay 3 and pitch 1. If you do, put the bottom 6 cards of your opponent's deck into their waiting room, and burn X, where X is Climaxes. Now obviously, the point of this combo is that you effectively only have to pitch one card to activate this ability, but the option to activate it even if you don't have the climax is still pretty neat and may win you a game or two in some niche situations. The ability itself, to reverse brainstorm for 6, is a deep dig, way deeper and sometimes double of what other similar abilities offer in other sets. This is extremely punishing to compressed late game decks, and for Fate, this is actually one of the first solid finishing options that has a real and threatening ability to close the game against an opponent who's prepared for the level 3 struggle. Also, because she's a master, she benefits from the strong master support of Fate's other powerful staples. And as we look into the future, people are experimenting with this new finisher and brewing totally new decks just because of how good this Sakura is. Hell, because the actual finishing ability isn't tied to a climax, people are still even running her raw in other decks without the gate climax. I may even build a deck for myself. Who knows? Another level 3 worth talking about in this fate set is Oath of the Sword, Saber. On play, she's a healer, and when she attacks with her climax combo, which is on a choice, you can put 3 master or servant characters from your hand into your waiting room. If you do, choose one of your characters and they get the following ability until the end of turn. Once per turn, when the damage from this card is cancelled, burn for 3 twice. Now this is incredibly expensive to activate, and a huge gamble in some cases with little payoff if your opponent just takes the attack damage. But again, against more compressed decks, this is extremely punishing, and when combined with all the existing Cancel Burn Saber has, this can make for a pretty scary top end. Moving along, something a little different is Temporary Coalition Rin. On play, you salvage a character, and with her combo, a Stock Soul, when the damage you dealt with her isn't cancelled, you can pay one, pitch one, and burn one. Strangely, that's all the text that's actually printed on the card, missing the clause that you would expect about only being able to activate this ability once per turn. So the way this is written, if you deal the attack damage and then burn 1 and they take the 1, you can keep burning for 1 as long as they don't cancel and you can pay the cost. 
Now, is that going to get expensive to activate in subsequent sequence? Absolutely. But consider that the climax is a stock soul and she salvages on play, so there's a lot of gas already. And how are you going to argue with a repeatable pay one, pitch one, burn one until you scrape that climax off the top of your opponent's deck and move on to the next attack? The only downside is that if your opponent just triple cancels, this card does nothing. That said, I'm definitely putting her in my Rin and Archer deck for the lol factor, but she's definitely not the only thing you can put into that red monster, or any other deck with red for that matter, because Rin got a new early play. Resolution to fight Rin is a 2 or less climax early play, and she heals on play. She's only base 8500, but has a resonate ability with an event called Jeweled Sword Zelrich. At the start of your climax phase, you can resonate with Zelrich, and she gets plus 3k until the end of your opponent's next turn, and this is a great transition into the new 3-1 counter event, Jeweled Sword Zelrich. First off, this card cannot be played if you don't have a jewel character, basically a Rin on the stage, but when you play it, you put it into your memory, and then choose one of your opponent's characters in battle, and they get plus X soul, where X is the number of Jeweled Sword Zelrich in your memory times 4. So basically, give your opponent's attacker plus 4 soul, and then if you have another one for some reason later, give another one plus 8 soul. Basically, the idea is to buy yourself another turn by making your opponent swing for massive damage that won't stick. At least we hope. But at any rate, this is pretty obnoxious since it's cheap to use and has a compounding effect. However, used caution, lest you take 8 to the face. And this is where I'm going to wrap up this set discussion. Now, I'm sure there are at least a few cards that deserved attention that I didn't touch upon. However, I maintain my opinion on the set as a whole that while it carries one of the biggest names in Wash 4s, it's a pretty disappointing overall package. That said, I can already see from the research I've done and the word on the street that even the small amount of really good stuff is already having a profound effect on how people are building fate. It goes to show that even one or two powerhouse cards can change a lot of the meta. I'm very interested to see how these seemingly tiny stones create big ripples in the fade meta in the coming months. As for me, I'll be linking my new and updated fate builds in green, red, and blue, and maybe I'll see about doing a deck tech for the new red, blue, yellow masters deck that people are trying out. But for now, this is all I'm going to say about the set. After all, this set was released only weeks between others, 7 Deadly Sins only a week or two ago, and of course, Slime 2 coming out soon, however, delayed because of COVID, unfortunately. But even then, there's a lot of content to work on. And unlike Heaven's View Volume 2, you're going to see a lot of exciting opening footage for Slime 2 right here on this channel, so look forward to that and other content as we move into the very exciting fall season for Weish 4s. And as always, thanks for watching. Peace.